First, before I introduce Hunter Lovins, a quick doctor-patient story. Doctor calls the patient. Mr. Patient, your tests are back. I have bad news, and I have worse news. Well, gee, Doc, what's the bad news? Mr. Patient, you only have 24 hours to live. Patient says, well, what's the worst news? Doctor says, we've been trying to reach you since yesterday. <laughs> well, in the matter of the Earth's environment, very serious matter, there is bad news, there is worse news, and there's some good news. And you're going to hear some good news today. The bad news is that even if humanity were to stop emitting carbon in the environment today, our planet is still into a, in a dangerous spiral. And we will have uh, pollution at dangerous levels for the foreseeable future. The worst news is that as a nation and as a planetary society, we do not currently appear to possess the political tools or the political will to make the necessary changes. At Boulder Rotary, thanks to the prescient leadership of Merrill Glustrom, Jim Rogoski, Grant Couch, and others, as a club, we're already moving in the right direction. Rotary International President Barry Racine, in the current issue of the Rotarian, says that climate change affects every one of Rotary's six areas of focus. And President Racine further says and tells us straight out, I quote, the next Rotary International President must make climate change Rotary's number one priority. You've heard the bad news, you've heard the worst news on the environment. Is there any good news? Hunter Levins will tell us today that there is some good news. In her 16th book, A Finer Future, Creating an Economy and Service to Life, Hunter tells us that our civilization already possesses the necessary scientific knowledge with the entrepreneurial spirit to create a regenerative economy in energy, agriculture, manufacturing, and transportation, an economy that works for people. And for you entrepreneurs out there, she will tell you that there is financial profit to be made in saving the earth. Now to tell you a little bit about Hunter. She has served as executive director of the Club of Rome, charged with implementing the Pope's encyclical on the environment. Hunter has briefed heads of state. She's testified before the US Congress, before the United Nations. She has uh, consulted with major corporations, Unilever, Walmart, Pentagon. She's done several TED Talks. She's testified, as I mentioned. Hunter has won numerous awards, dozens, including my favorite, which is Time Magazine's Millennium Hero for the Planet. She's a lawyer, professor, scientist, and if she has any spare time, she serves as an EMT firefighter. Never without a black Stetson hat and a plan up her sleeve, I give you Hunter Lovins. Bobby, thank you, and thanks to all of you, and wow, if uh, your president is saying that the, uh, the next president has to have climate change as your primary topic, you're with it. Whatever you thought your agenda was, it changed this fall, and it changed because of these two reports. The IPCC report that says what we thought previously, that it was okay to go to two degrees C warming, now, it's got to be 1.5 as the safe level. By safe, they mean 50-50 chance you won't have catastrophe. Uh, if I told you, come, drive with me, 50-50 chance we won't have catastrophe, I believe you'd drive with Bobby. <clears throat> Two degrees C is vastly more dangerous than anybody thought, and we are already seeing the results. The Bering Sea was just declared ice-free for the first time at this time of year. The violence of the storms that we're seeing, in the 80s we averaged $1 billion storm a year, 
in the 90s, two such in the aughts, five such. 2011 set a new record with 14 of the buggers. Last year set records for the amount of insurance damage to the point that uh, today's news, Munich Re, is saying pretty soon we're not going to be able to afford insurance. The Thomas Fire in California, the Camp Fire in California have now bankrupted Pacific Gas and Electric. The hurricane in Florida, this is Mexico Beach two weeks before and then a week after. And just last week, just, well, right here, the bomb cyclone hit here. Out east, it's doing a great deal more damage. Killing livestock and flooding Nebraska. Right now, Nebraska is underwater. And that water is going to continue downstream. This wreck ain't over with yet. And we have nothing compared to the people in Mozambique, Cyclone Idai. Their reckoning may leave a thousand dead, hundreds and thousands homeless. And it is costing business right now. These gentlemen, businessmen all, Bloomberg, Tom Steyer, Hank Paulson, wrote a report a few years back called Risky Business, saying that climate change is already harming business and will continue to do so. The recent uh, government assessment that it's costing taxpayers $350 billion over the last decade, and that figure is just going to go up. At the same time, it is costing citizens their ability to make a living, such that incomes are expected to decline from climate change. Food costs will go up. Water availability will shrink. There will either be too much of it or too little of it. This is the assessment just out from our government, saying that it could cost some sectors of the economy losses exceeding $100 billion each year by the end of the century. Now, with all of this bad news, a NASA-funded study came out looking at collapse throughout human history. And they found that it's actually fairly common. When it happens, it lasts for hundreds to thousands of years, you really don't like the outcome. They said it's driven by one or both of two things. You overrun your resource base or you have high levels of inequality. Hello, we have both. And what we have to do to deal, for example, with climate change is going to be a job of work. This is not going to be easy. The Paris projections have us still going up. We have got to drop emissions, and we've got to do it fast. Climate change is only one of the planetary boundaries there that we are at risk of exceeding. <clears throat> We're losing biodiversity. Tom Lovejoy at the Smithsonian with uh, Global Biodiversity Outlook 3 said, we're losing life now at a faster rate than since when the dinosaurs went extinct. Coral reefs, sorry scuba divers, perhaps as early as 2035, there will be no living coral reefs on planet Earth. The Amazon is drying up and burning if Bolsonaro is not plowing it under. And the oceans are acidifying. We're losing phytoplankton in the oceans. These are one of the little critters on Earth that give us oxygen. At the same time, we are failing to meet the human minimums. This is the concept of donut economics put forth by Kate Rayworth in the United Kingdom, that we have to be below the planetary boundaries and above the human minimums, this sweet and just operating space for humanity. Now, faced with all of this, some people say, it's too late. Don't do this, but you can Google near-term human extinction and find what appears to be pretty good science that says humans go extinct within 10 years. I say don't do this because it'll put you in a very bad mood. I also think it is the most profoundly irresponsible position that we can take. We are the result of 3.5 billion years of evolution. Let's act like it. So what will it take? 
living within the ecological limits, meeting the basic needs of all humans on Earth, and ensuring sufficient equity that we have the social stability. Now, how did we get into this mess? It's worth looking at a little history because the trouble we're in is the result of a story gone wrong. In 1947, 36 men, and yeah, they were all men, got together at a hotel outside Montreux, Switzerland, called Mont Pelerin, and argued about how to create a better world after World War II. 47, Europe's in ruins. Ludwig von Mises is appalled at what National Socialism has done to trash Europe. Friedrich Hayek is scared to death of the rise in the East of Soviet collectivism. And Milton Friedman believes that the individual is the only legitimate political actor. These guys put forth the theory of neoliberalism, that what really matters, all that matters is your personal freedom. Your personal freedom is best expressed in the marketplace. Therefore, we don't need government except to have a police force and a military. They founded a group called the Mont Pelerin Society. Friedman took over the Chicago School of Economics. They got their members as advisors to every head of state on the planet. This is Hayek with Reagan. In 1980, Reagan was elected in the United States, Thatcher in the UK, and this ideology became the global dominant economic narrative. Get government out of the way. All we need is the manifestly perfect market, and all will be good. Except that it wasn't. Up until 1980, all classes were coming up together. After 1980, only the 1%. This is the Oxfam number from about three years ago, that 85 richest people have as much wealth as the bottom 3.5 billion poorest, and this is two years ago. You okay with that? Remember the handy study, one of the triggers of global collapse is high levels of inequality? Here we are. The humble folk singer said the key to the future of the world is finding the optimistic stories and letting them be known. So I think we need a new story to counter the neoliberal story. And it starts with the fact that we don't have any choice. Business as usual, we are looking at collapse. And none of us want that. Two, we have the solutions. Three, it's just better business. You will make more money. And four, you will like it when you get there. This is the thesis of our new book. I say our because this was written by four of us. I did most of the writing, but it drew heavily on the work of Stuart Wallace, who for many years ran New Economics Foundation in the UK, Anders Wiegmann, who was co-president of the Club of Rome, Swedish parliamentarian, and John Fullerton, who was 18 years at J.P. Morgan, left as managing director, walked away to create Capital Institute to try to transform finance. We started by saying, is that neoliberal story true? The neolibs have an assumption, which is we're all greedy bastards, but that's OK, because in a free market, you against me will somehow aggregate to the greater good for all, except that it doesn't, and it turns out it's bad science. The evolutionary biologists, the, uh, the archaeologists, the anthropologists say it's not true. When the first humans came down out of the trees in Africa, our claws aren't worth much. Our teeth are pretty inadequate. We're not as fast as a lion. Our ancestors survived, and thus you are here today, because not only did they have a drive to acquire and a drive to defend, which we share with all animals, they had a drive to bond. They cared. This is the skull of an old man who was toothless. He got to be old, and he survived being toothless because his band cared. In a social Darwinist 
only the meanest bastard survives, he would have been left behind. And there were apparently lots of bands of pre-humans who went extinct. Those who survived, and we know this from the DNA, were those who cared. They cared for the elderly, they cared for the disabled. They cared more for the good of the whole than any one of them cared for him or herself. And they had a drive to tell story, to create meaning. So here's the meaning today. We, the people, planet, are in service to the economy, which is in service to finance. We're really good at driving money to the top. What's wrong with this picture? It's wrong way round. <clears throat> finance is a tool to bring liquidity to the real economy, which needs to be in service to life. We are now in a degenerative economy. We are destroying life. And we need to move up this ramp through green, through what is today called sustainable, through restoring damaged ecosystems and human communities to what my friend John Fullerton calls a regenerative economy. This is an economy in service to life. There is no silver bullet, but we sure got a lot of silver buckshot. William Gibson said, the future's already here, it's just not widely distributed. And as Bobby said, we have all the technologies that we need to solve the most pressing problems. I worked with a man named Tony Seba. Tony's a Stanford prof. Some of you may have heard him speak when he was here at World Affairs. He says, inevitably, by 2030, the world will be 100% renewably powered for fundamental economic reasons. Four drivers fall in the cost of solar, fall in the cost of storage, batteries, the electric car, the driverless car. Excel Energy, our coal-loving utility, whom one of my favorite heroes, Leslie Glostrom, has been uh, battling over the years, put out an all-source bid a couple years ago. Who can get us 1,100 megawatts, any source, any price, everybody bid? The lowest fossil bid, four cents a kilowatt hour. Wind, a little below two cents. Solar, a little above two cents. Wind plus solar plus storage batteries, three cents a kilowatt hour. Excel said, no, bid it again. Uh, we now have the solar tariffs, so everybody bid it again. Prices came back fractionally higher, but same ratios. Excel said, huh. Went to the PUC, said, well, can we close two of those coal plants Leslie's been fighting? And pledged to go two-thirds renewables. They've now pledged to go 100% renewable. Go, Leslie. China is the 800-pound uh, the gorilla. They have already installed more solar than they had said they were going to do in 2020. In the first three months of last year, they brought on the equivalent of 10 nuclear plants worth of solar in, in three months. Electric cars. Little Tesla. For a time there, it was valued at more than the market cap of General Motors. What's its business model? Clearly, it's not cars, although they are now shipping more cars per month than BMW or Lexus. What business are they in? Batteries. It's a battery company. And when the Aliso Canyon natural gas well blew out in Southern California, releasing a lot of methane and putting Southern California Edison at risk of not being able to supply power, Elon said, let's build a battery. So they did. And then South Australia, they, uh, he put in a 100 megawatt uh, array in South Australia. After Hurricane Maria, he started shipping power walls and solar panels. China is phasing out the internal combustion engine. This is already dropping global automobile sales. Why did General Motors close the seven plants? Because they say we're getting ready for the electric vehicle and the autonomous vehicle. Batteries, China will in 2020 bring on, excuse me, 2021, bring on 20 
battery factories the size of Elon's in Nevada. It is already, according to the National Renewable Energy Lab just down the road, cost effective if you're a business to install batteries to deal with peak pricing in the afternoon. In Arizona, Arizona Public Service peak, 50 cents a kilowatt hour, off peak five. So you put a battery in for the two hours a day. But if you've put a battery in, why don't you put solar on your roof and cut the tie? Or sign up for storage as a service. These companies are now being created. New York Power Authority, one of New York's utilities, is now going to offer this as a service to its businesses. The AEV, they're on the road today. There are, it's now 48 companies working on these things. It's a who's who of the automobile industry and a number of other industries. And here's where it gets interesting. The Fitch Group came out a few years back. They're one of the rating agencies like Moody's and Standard and & Poor's and they said, if Elon hits his target of a 200 mile, $35,000 vehicle, the oil industry is in trouble, and so is the utility industry. Bloomberg. And it is actually worse than that. A group called Carbon Tracker in the UK came out with a report last fall called Vision 2020. They said, when a new technology hits 3% of a market, the incumbent has started to peak. And they said clean energy is already at 6%. They put peak fossil at 2023, and they said the assets about to be stranded of the fossil companies are $25 trillion. In contrast, the 08 mortgage collapse was over 2.7 in stranded mortgage assets. Where is your money? If it's tied up in ordinary funds, you probably own fossil companies. And if you own fossil, you own climate change. This is now being called the carbon bubble. Joe Rome put it at 22 trillion. John Fullerton put it at 20 to 30 trillion. Al Gore recently came out and said 23 trillion. I, take your pick, it's big. So our president said we are not going to be part of the Paris Accords. Well, a number of states, cities, universities, and corporations said we're still in. Why would they say this? Because cutting your carbon emissions is good for business. We worked with Fort Collins, which announced the uh, Climate Economy Initiative. Their municipal product up about 25%. Carbon emissions down about 12. Boulder did even better, creating 7,500 new jobs. Gross domestic product increase of 7.8 billion or 49%, emissions down 13% from 2005 to 2016. This is how you drive an economy. You make a commitment to do the right thing. And we were talking a, a bit ago about how do you deal with companies that say, I don't believe in climate change. It's easy, fine. Climate change is a hoax. Don't go to Vegas on the odds of that being true, but if all you are is a profit-maximizing capitalist, you'll do exactly what you'd do if you were scared to death of climate change because we know how to solve this problem at a profit. If it's a hoax, we make a lot of money. If it's real, we make a lot of money. Oh, and we're on our way to solving the problem. Either way, let's go. When the Kentucky Coal Museum put solar on its roof rather than plug in to the coal-fired grid at its doorstep, you know it's over. The fossil era is over. But remember, two-thirds of all emissions come from 90 entities. The oil majors, the coal majors, and the sovereign wealth funds of places like Saudi and Venezuela. Again, where is your money? Beavis Longstreth, who was uh, on the SEC, said, uh, 
It's entirely plausible, even predictable, that continuing to hold equities in fossil fuel companies will be ruled negligence. Because the fossil companies, well, there's only one anymore in the top 10 of the S&P, Exxon, and it's now dragging the index down. For years, it led it. And so if all you wanted was more money, yeah, sure, invest in Exxon. If the New York Common Fund had divested 10 years ago, it's a big pension fund in New York State, they would have made $17.5 billion more than they did if they had invested in anything else in the economy. So a couple years ago, a group of us got together and created a little exchange-traded fund. You can go to uh, change-finance.com. This is truly fossil fuel free. 100 large cap American companies, and so far, it's been outperforming. So here's half the answer to the climate crisis at a profit. The other half is under our feet. It's agriculture. We know how to take carbon out of the air and put it back in the soil where it belongs by what's called holistic management. And again, it's a Boulder outfit that's leading this. The Savory Institute, right here in Boulder, is showing that if you manage grazing animals the way grasslands co-evolved with ungulates, with ruminants, you take carbon out of the air and put it in the soil. Meet Gabe Brown. He's a North Dakota corn soybean farmer who was going broke. <laughs> he said, I'm going broke, I'll try anything. First he went to no-till. He stopped breaking the soil and inverting it, thereby releasing a lot of carbon. He then started planting cover crops. You may have seen a week ago, General Mills announced it's going to work with its suppliers on a million acres to go to no-till and planting cover crops. And then Gabe introduced animal impact. He turned cattle out, sheep, goats, chickens, pigs, to eat the cover crops. Now he is not paying for hay. He's not paying for the energy to turn over the soil. And he has gone on some of his paddocks from a little over 1% soil organic matter to over 11%. He's rolling climate change backward and he is wildly profitable. He's got a new book out called Dirt to Soil. If you want to know exactly what he did, get a hold of it, brilliant book. But this is what we're talking about with these long roots of native prairie grasses or the cover crops. So Patagonia is working with the Land Institute in Salina, Kansas creating beer out of the Kernza wheat that is a perennial wheat. You don't have to break the soil, comes up every year, compared to the annual wheat right next to it. Bobby said he wanted some good news. Here it is, the fossil era is over. The work now begins. What kind of a world do we want to live in? What do we want our communities to be like? So a group of us got together and created a regenerative community hub. Uh, doing this with John Fullerton, who is doing these hubs all over the world. John's fond of watersheds. I said, well, oh, what is our watershed? Turns out we are the Upper South Platte River watershed. So we said, oh, cool. That includes Fort Collins. It, leaves out Colorado Springs, which thank you for the moment, I'm very happy to leave out. I don't want to have too many fights all at once. But it also includes Iowa and Nebraska and the, all the area downstream. So I'm now working with a team all the way to Kansas City to put a regional hub together. If you want to follow what we're doing, go on regencommunities.net and you can join. I asked my team, you know, after uh, we lost uh, Prop 112 here, because, said the oil companies with $40 million, oil and fossil is jobs. So, really, what are the jobs here? It turns out clean tech already employs about as many as fossil, 
and clean techs going up and fossils going down. Tech entrepreneuring, vastly more jobs, three times as many jobs as oil and gas. The outdoor industries in Colorado, four times all of the extractive industries. Snow sports delivers more jobs and revenue than the extractive industries in the whole country. And natural foods is bigger than industrial agriculture. Industrial agriculture's net income is going down. Natural foods is growing rapidly. Colorado is already on its way to being a regenerative economy. We just don't know it yet. We have the wrong narrative. So we're in the process of finalizing these numbers, and I'm going to go have a sit down with our governor, who uh, many of you know, and say, what would it be if Colorado committed to becoming a regenerative economy? Margaret Mead said, change is hard. The only person who likes change is a wet baby. And I'd argue the baby squalls all the way through the process. But consider this little guy. He's, a, he's an extractive critter, crawls around eating leaves, until one day he stops and enters the chrysalis. You ever broke one of these things apart? There's no worm in there. There's no butterfly in there. It's just goo. And maybe if our world feels a bit gooey right now, it's because we're in the midst of the most profound transformation humankind's ever been through. But if we're patient, something starts to emerge. And it's fragile at first. My old boss, Dave Brower, once helped a butterfly. He broke away the chrysalis. And what was left was this crippled little thing. The butterfly gains the, its strength by the fight of breaking out of the old container. We know how to build a world that works. We have all of the technology. When we do it, we will unleash the greatest prosperity humanity has ever known. Does this sound like it's worth doing? <laughs> then let's fly. Thank you. Hunter, I want to thank you for that presentation. Hunter, please accept our thanks for that wonderful presentation and that you have the drive, the vision, and the knowledge to help take us to where we need to go with clean energy future. So thank you very much. In your honor, our Rotary Club and Rotary Clubs all over the world who are now going to engage in climate change, thanks to our Rotary International President, uh, have been working carefully and assiduously to get rid of the scourge of polio. And Carl Tinsman, one of our members, has been key in that process. I want to thank Carl for that. Uh, and in your honor for giving the speech, we have, uh, we're going to donate 100 doses of polio vaccine uh, to get rid of the final few cases that are still around in the world. So thank you, Hunter. Much appreciated. Thank you, Meryl.